Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't, who don't know me, my name is Rachel Fishman, and I am the Deputy Director for Higher Education Research at New America. Um, and today, along with my co-author, Sophie Nguyen, we're going to share some of the data about varying degrees, which is our annual survey on higher education that looks at Americans' perceptions of the value of educational opportunities after high school, how those opportunities are funded, and how we hold institutional institutions accountable for this investment. So we now have five years of data, and I want you to sit with this for a moment and what the past five years have looked like in this country. We've been through two tumultuous presidential elections and an insurrection on Capitol Hill. We uh, have experienced a global pandemic that is still ongoing and has been devastating. We have seen economic recovery after the Great Recession. We've seen a pandemic induced recession. And then we've seen recovery again, though just like the Great Recession, this, this recovery has been incredibly inequitable. We've seen midterm elections, a culture war on campus, and a racial reckoning. Now this is the year anniversary of George Floyd's murder, um, this racial reckoning that has been long overdue. I think about how much my own life has changed over the past five years. For me personally, it's meant having two children and all the wonder that they bring, um, buying my first house, paying down and almost off my student loan debt, uh, and professionally, I've seen people come and go at New America because I've been here for over five years now, but I've certainly been here for every iteration of varying degrees. Um, and I'm so happy that we're welcoming some of them back today to discuss, uh, discuss this data and, and how it's changed and how it hasn't over the past five years. Um, through all of this, we at New America uh, work on and adapt varying degrees every year. And we're just sort of in awe of how steadfast people really believe in the value of education, despite all that has changed over the past five years in this country and for people personally. So before I begin, I really want to thank um, two of our other co-workers this year, Elin Johnson and Lupita Romo Gonzalez. And I also want to um, thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for making this work possible. Um, and please feel free to tweet at uh, hashtag varying degrees and visit varyingdegrees.org um, to see all of the data, more of the findings. You can play around with the data tool. You can download the data files. It's a veritable treasure trove of, of public opinion data. So let's get started on um, the next slide. Um, we will see that uh, there is a simmering pessimism about whether colleges and universities are leading the country in a positive or negative direction. So as I mentioned before, not a lot has changed over the past uh, few years, but we are starting to see some change. Now, this was a question that was new last year, and it is a adapted um, from a Pew Research Center survey that asked the exact same question and found that over the years, it has asked it for many, many years, but over the years, it has found that Americans, the, uh, the view that Americans um, think that colleges and universities have a positive effect has really notably declined. So the last time they collected this data was in 2019 and it was at 50% believe that colleges and universities are having a positive effect on the way things are going in this country. And notably in their data, they saw uh, a lot of, uh, a quite a, a majority of Republicans saying that, um, that they believe that colleges and universities have a negative effect on the way things are going in this country. So we decided to ask the same question on our survey, which is predominantly about higher, um, higher education, whereas the Pew survey was about institutions in America in general. So it wasn't just about colleges and universities, it was also about unions and churches and Congress, all those various 
institutions nationwide. We got wildly different results in 2020. We found 69% believe that colleges and universities were having a positive effect. I want to note that in 2020, we collected this data right before the pandemic hit. So we collected it in February. Um, one year later, we've seen a decline of 11 percentage points, which is significant, along with declines among party lines, notably among Republicans, as you're looking at the data here. Um, and so I don't know if that's just because of the particularity of this year and COVID-19 and just pessimism in this country in general, or if we're going to continue to see a decline next year. It's certainly something to watch. But on the next slide, as you'll see, something that has remained constant over the years is that people believe that education after high school continues to offer a good return on investment. We've been asking this question since 2017, and since 2018, we've been collecting party ID data. And as you can see, both Democrats, Republicans agree that higher education offers a return, a good return on investment for the student. On the next slide, you'll see that this year we've asked a few questions about online education, especially because we had such a dramatic pivot online for most college students this year. Um, not pictured here, but over half, 61% of Americans believe that the quality of online learning is worse than in-person instruction. And then as you can see here, four and five believe that online programs, ones that were traditionally always online even before the pandemic, should cost less than those that are offered in person. On the next slide, you'll see that Americans remain divided on the availability of a high quality and affordable education after high school. It's, it's split almost 50-50. Um, this is where we'll see a notable uh, partisan divide where Democrats strongly to somewhat disagree with this statement and Republicans strongly to somewhat agree with this statement. And then on the next slide, I think what's important um, context for this sort of disagreement between Democrats and Republicans is that um, both Democrats and Republicans still believe that more uh, state and that federal and state governments must spend more to make higher ed more affordable. Of course, you're going to see it at much higher rates for Democrats, where they say 93% for both federal and state governments spending more. Um, but importantly to remember, both Republican, uh, Republicans believe that both states and the federal government should spend money to make higher ed more affordable for students. And so I'm going to turn it over to Sophie to discuss a little bit more of our findings. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. Hello, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name is Sophie Nguyen. I'm the policy analyst for the higher education team at New America. And I have been very fortunate to be able to work alongside with Rachel and other team members um, in the high ed team on varying degrees for the past years. Um, so, so to continue uh, showing you some of the highlights of this year's survey, um, in the next slide, please. Um, so um, our size, uh, values, and fundings accountability is also one area that um, that very degrees focus on. Um, in this year's surveys, uh, most Americans think that colleges and universities should provide uh, publicly data that indicate quality, such as graduation rate and employment rate. 93% of Americans think that this is very or somewhat important. And uh, this number has been largely unchanged since um, 2019, which is also the first year we asked these questions. In the, um, in the next figure, you see that um, a majority of Americans uh, support the idea that colleges and universities should lose some access to taxpayer dollars if they fail to meet certain indicator of quality, such as low graduation rates, or low rate of graduate earning a living, um, low rate of graduate earning a living wage, or high default rate on student loan repayment. In the next slide, um, so um, given that the Biden administration now has a lot of proposal for education after high school. In this surveys, uh, in this year's survey, we asked Americans what they think should be the most important 
for the president and also Congress to implement. So um, as you can see in this graph, um, more than half of Americans want to prioritize policy that uh, focus on making education after high school more affordable, such that 23% of Americans want to, uh, want to prioritize um, tuition-free community college. 18% um, want to prioritize making um, public four-year colleges and university tuition-free. Um, another 40% of, um, of Americans want to prioritize policies that work to alleviate the burden of repaying student debt for borrower. 19% um, of Americans want to um, make more, um, make income driven repayment plans um, more accessible to borrower. And 13% of Americans want to prioritize um, forgiveness of $10,000 on student loan debt. Um, in the next slide. So um, I would say one of the hotly debated conversations of last summer among colleges and university was whether to um, open the campus in the fall semester of 2020 and, um, and, and bring students back. And um, in this year's surveys, we asked what Americans think about it. And 57% uh, of Americans think that this is the right decision. But I would want to caution that this is the questions that we also see um, a lot of differences among different demographic groups especially among Democrat and Republicans. Not picture here, but 39% um, of Democrats agree with this decision compared to 84% of Republicans. Um, in the next slide. So another change that colleges and university adapt um, in the last academic year was to waive the requirement for standardized tests such as SAT and ACT. 67% um, actually of Americans agree with these decisions. Among these people, um, more than half of them still want some versions of these decisions to continue after the pandemic in that 35% uh, wants to make ACT and SAT optional moving forward. And 16% uh, suggest that it should, we should drop standardized tests completely. Having said that, 41% still want SAT and ACT to be required but only used in combination with other requirements such as GBA or extracurricular activities. Um, so I think that's it for um, the presentations of our findings today, but we really hope that you um, will go to varying degrees or to read our report this year and explore our data um, more in depth. So I'm gonna now kick it back to Rachel to introduce our panel today. Thanks, Sophie. So um, I will note that you can ask an, a, any questions about the data and we will, of course, um, try to answer them. We have, uh, we're going to open up for question and answer at the end, but we want to go right into um, our discussion today. So joining myself and Sophie will be Alejandra Acosta, um, who's a policy analyst at New America, um, Ernest Iswego, who is a policy analyst at the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association, and Ashley Clark. And we're going to be moderated by uh, Tamara Heiler, who is the Director of Education at Third Way. So I am going to turn it over to Tamara to get us going. Hi, um, thanks so much everyone for having me here today. I feel very honored that I get to be part of this sort of family reunion um, of New America and get to moderate sort of, you know, what I've been able to witness working in the public opinion space 
from third ways perspective, um, you know, have obviously been following very de varying degrees over the last five years and, you know, have been lucky enough to work with all of you as sort of a brain trust um, as we continue to get this really important data and, you know, be able to see how some of these perceptions and trends have changed and in many ways not changed uh, over time. Um, before I jump into questions, though, I'm going to do something a little, a little silly here, but I did do a little bit of Googling in honor of your five year anniversary as varying degrees. Uh, and according to the internet, I found out that the traditional gift for a five year anniversary is wood and the modern gift is silverware. And since I know how much work and effort that you all put into putting this survey together every single year, um, I've made you all a commemorative wooden spoon that, <laughs> that at some point when I see you guys in real life again, I will give it to you. My husband was very confused when I was like, don't worry about it. I'm just going to write on a Sharpie on one of our spoons. But this will stay here forever for you guys to commemorate. This is a big deal. So congratulations uh, on, on all of the hard work. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and, and jump right in. I know that you guys were giving us um, some of the, you know, most important findings, but there is a lot to unpack here and also just to get better perspectives of everything that goes into putting this survey together every year. So um, as Rachel said, just as a friendly reminder, we will have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, and so just continue putting those in and I'll make sure to monitor those and, and leave plenty of time at the end for the questions that you all have. Um, so for the first question, I'm gonna actually just have this be open to everyone on the panel, but actually Alejandra, I'd love to start with you. Um, but over the years, I know you've all worked on this survey in, in varying forms. And so I'd love to know what findings have you found to be the most surprising or noteworthy and why? And in particular, is there anything from this year's survey that you found maybe confounding or, you know, extra surprising given um, everything that we've gone through in 2021? So Alejandra, why don't you kick, it, kick things off for us? Cool. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I don't know if this is surprising, it's definitely pleasantly surprising to me, um, but I've, I've loved to see, or I, I love that Americans' views of um, accountability and holding institutions accountable hasn't really changed over the past five years. And I think that that's really interesting because it's such a complex issue, um, but nonetheless, Americans really care about this. Um, and so as we've seen, and, and as Sophia and Rachel said earlier, this opinion hasn't really changed over the past five years. Five years, When I was an author a couple of years ago, I wrote um, an op-ed with our former colleague, Claire McCann, on um, how even across political parties, there was a pretty strong desire to see institutions held accountable. So I think to me, it's really cool to see that this hasn't really changed and that across demographics, across political parties, across over time, um, this is still a really strong sentiment. And I think that this is really important because accountability um, to me really is an equity issue. We see that low-income students, students of color, um, first-gen students are often the ones who get the short end of the stick in higher ed. And so to me, um, holding institutions accountable, of course, with nuance, of course, with understanding of the different missions, the different challenges that they face, and of course, with the allocation of appropriate resources, I think nonetheless, holding institutions accountable is really important because um, you know, it, it's one of the various things that we can do to bring more equity and close, rec e close equity gaps in higher ed. Um, so to me, I'm not surprised um, necessarily, but I am happy to see that this has stayed um, over time. So to me, that's the one thing that has stood out over, um, over the time that I've been at New America and been uh, watching how varying degrees in Americans' opinions change or don't change. Ernest, how about you? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think that was about to say the same thing. I'll let you. I'll switch to my second answer, my backup. Uh, just in case. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, for me, what has been uh, particularly noteworthy, um, surprising, and also unsurprising, and also kind of confounding. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> has been the the drop this year in particular of Americans who believe that colleges and universities are having a positive effect on the way that things are going in the country across, you know, from this year to, uh, sorry, the 2021 iteration, uh, from the 2020 iteration. 
Um, you know, it's obviously noteworthy because uh, this is kind of one of the questions of, of varying degrees that best gets at and best illuminates how Americans are consuming kind of the value proposition of higher education um, and college, you know, and that has severe implications, obviously, for how it's funded, how it's legislated, um, you know, this continued kind of political, uh, politi the political process around higher education, <laughs> it was the of that word, um, you know, the drop is, in a sense, unsurprising, if you consider how tumultuous um, the political, you know, discourse and, and the polarization around higher education has been over the past few years, um, but it's surprising in that uh, higher education's consistent battle with the question of work, right, um, is very rarely one that higher education's lost, right? Um, even considering, you know, the two stories that we tell about higher education and, and what people experience, even considering, um, you know, the all the drama that we've had over for-profit institutions over the past few years, um, you know, higher education usually kind of comes out on top, so to speak. People continue to believe that it's worth it, um, and it is, uh, but it's very interesting just to see that drop happen in the course of a year. Um, of course, a number of things like both Rachel and, and Sophie mentioned, a number of things could have contributed to that. Um, but still, it, it's, it's fascinating to see that kind of drop in public opinion. And it's one of those ones that you know, I'll be paying attention to in the survey um, as time goes on. Uh, yeah. Great. Ashley? Yeah, so I would say one particular finding that was surprising to me this year was around um, the percentage of adults in general and the percentage of students who felt that colleges did extra things in light of COVID, including extra basic needs supports, those sorts of things. I found it surprising that on a whole, students tended to actually have slightly more positive views about what the institutions did um, than adults in general. So it maybe makes me think that institutions aren't messaging to the public as a whole some of the things that they're doing that students are seeing but the public isn't seeing. Um, but even though students had a more positive view, generally fewer than half of students still felt that these institutions were doing these extra steps. There were some that were over half, but generally it was lower. So it's, I would, I think institutions feel like they are doing a lot and so, but then the perception doesn't really necessarily reflect that. So I think um, institutions maybe aren't messaging to the public the way that they think that they are, some of the things that they're doing uh, to support students in the pandemic. Interesting, I'd love to unpack more of that in a bit as well. Um, Sophie and Rachel, as you know, two people who've kind of had the ability to oversee this now for, for five years, what other sort of surprising or confounding results have you found um, during that time? Um, I can kick glasses start it. Uh, so I would say um, no particular result in, in general for me. Uh, the one thing that I am proud uh, that varying degree has been able to do in the past year and continue to do this year is the ability to track responses across different uh, demographic groups. I think this is one particular thing that is very unique to varying degrees uh, like we, we we have uh, we present our data um, by not just by uh, party ID, even though that's like usually the thing that we mostly report on, but also by uh, like age, generation, race, um, race and ethnicity, household income, and like this year we also have um, uh, student status and um, student loan borrower status. So. Um, I think this is, uh, and like for me, the fascinating thing is to uh, like look at the response and look at those responses different across um, gener uh, across demographic groups. So like the questions that I mentioned earlier about um, um, like college reopening plan in for the fall semester of, of um, 2020, um, I think like so, we see drastic difference among demographic uh, among Democrat and Republican. We also see significant uh, responses among um, like white versus people of color. So um, yeah, that's something uh, for anyone who interested in varying degrees. This is an, like a very um, like unique opportunity to actually learn about um, like perceptions of higher ed across 
um, demographics in America? Yeah, I would say for me, what has been confounding this year and where I'm struggling a bit is that, and I didn't mention this in the data presentation, but to Ernest's point, we saw this decline in whether or not people believe that uh, higher education or colleges and universities are leading the country in a positive or a negative uh, direction. So it's still in the majority positive, but pretty significant decline this year. Also this year though, like in tandem with that data is that um, we've asked since 2019, um, who should be more responsible for funding higher education? So this is a forced choice question where there's not like that much wiggle room other than just like literally skipping the question or saying, I don't know, um, but you have to choose one. Do you think it's the government because it's good for society? Is that who should fund it? Or is it the student because they're the ones who personally benefit? And since 2019, 2019 to 2020, it remains pretty steady in favor of government um, at 63%. Uh, but we saw a six percentage point decline this year. So uh, it's still again in the majority where 57% say it should be government because it's good for society. But I can't really explain that decline other than again what the craziness of this year, institutions and how they dealt with uh, COVID-19 and the recession and the uh, murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out, um, but it's definitely a conundrum for me, particularly too when you pair it with like all the things we're seeing about people wanting higher ed to be more affordable. <laughs> so I'm just like, well, they want higher education to be more affordable. They want Biden and Congress to prioritize uh, affordability. Um, and yet they also are starting to lean a little bit more in the direction of students should fund it because they're the ones who personally benefit. So I'm having a little bit of trouble reconciling those. And honestly, like who knows if it's a blip of a trend given this year, but it's definitely something I'm gonna watch next year. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating. And I do wonder too how much of that is just, I feel like political awareness about government. And as you said, institutions and all of these things have really sort of peaked over the last year in ways, but it will be interesting to see if that's going to be sustained in non-election cycles and when maybe things level out a bit. Um, great. Well, I'm going to ask each of you now just some um, specific questions, but please, others should feel free to weigh in if you have other things you want to add to, to people's answers here. Um, so Ernest, I think um, it's a good place to start here as a former you know, co-author and someone who can now sort of refer to varying degrees data in your new role at SHEO. Um, how do you think these data provide value to various stakeholders, such as your members? And what are the data points that you find yourself referencing the most, um, you know, either in the past or that now that there's a new batch of data, you're going to see yourself really sort of using that to propel your work moving forward? Yeah, no, thank you for asking. Um, you know, public opinion uh, right next to evidence-based research is a critical component of policymaking, right, especially for our members of uh, these state higher education executives who are largely concerned with the funding of higher education in their states and the funding of adjacent processes like uh, state post-secondary data systems, for example, which is what a lot of work, what I work on at CHEO. Um, so synthesizing public opinion, research, and uh, politics, kind of what the political atmosphere is, uh, creates a lot of the landscape for which our members act. Um, for example, uh, she had just released a report that found that when states cut funding to public institutions, um, institutional revenue declines, enrollment is impacted, and graduation rates and completion rates also decline. Um, but that political effect has kind of a public opinion, opinion effect as well, um, which our members then have to manage uh, while working to bolster higher education in their respective states, do research and political advocacy, bolster funding, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I certainly don't envy uh, the work that a lot of them have to do managing this, but that's certainly why, like, you know, varying degrees and, and, and another public opinion on higher education is important to them. Um, you know, as far as what I find myself referencing the most often, uh, slash what I'll continue to probably reference uh, the most, especially um, in my work at SHEO, is the data point on whether Americans think they can get a high quality education after high school uh, that's also affordable, um, and whether they think that'll lead to uh, well-paying jobs. Um, 
you know, it's something that, uh, again, our states are really concerned with. Um, even from a data perspective, even thinking about state post-secondary data systems, um, which again is my work, um, you know, you can kind of track historically when a lot of states began to collect data elements um, and, and began to link their state post-secondary data systems to workforce data systems, et cetera, et cetera, um, all, along those lines. So that's something that I'll definitely be kind of looking to see how that, you know, how the public opinion shifts on that if it does in future years. So, sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah, unmuted. I'm sorry. It's bound to happen one time. Um, sorry about that. Ali, I was going to say I'm hopping back over to you now because I know that New America and Shio have been working um, for over a year on a joint project about the effects of the pandemic on higher education. And varying degrees this year sort of reveals how Americans feel colleges and universities have handled the pandemic, which we sort of started to touch on a little bit um, in terms of reopening and supporting their students. And so can you speak a little bit more about how this data puts into perspective what you've been hearing about students and institutional needs during the pandemic? Yeah, for sure. Um, we did several focus groups with students um, through this project. And so we got to hear in detail how students felt about um, the opening and closing of colleges during the pandemic and just everything else that was going on um, in this past year. Um, I think there was like one good thing that stood out to me um, in varying degrees and then one not so good thing. Um, the good thing, as Ashley mentioned, is a lot of students, like when you break it down by um, current student status, a lot of students felt that colleges were actually following through and providing some of the basic resources that they needed um, and doing a relatively good job at like handling this pivot during this really crazy time. Um, but at the same time, we know um, from some of the other data in varying degrees and also what we've heard from institutional leaders and from students throughout the year is that this is really unequal. It really depended on um, what the resources at a college looked like. And so it's good to see that people felt that overall colleges were doing a good job, but um, you know, once you're on the ground, it can look pretty different. Um, the other thing is, is the return to in-person classes was very, very politicized um, and very much a personal preference. Um, kind of opinion. Um, and so it was hard. It's been hard to see like, I mean, thankfully varying degrees offers a really good high level look at this, but just like throughout the year, it was really difficult to see like how colleges should respond. Should they come back in person? Should they not? Um, because it really just came down to political preference for a lot of people. Um, and it was also very politicized um, state by state. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll say um, from this project is, we, is we've taken a really deep dive on online learning. And so like learned how this kind of works, what some good practices are. Um, we learned that it's not always actually cheaper for colleges to go online or to provide online classes. So um, I think as Ashley mentioned, there might be some messaging, if possible, some messaging issues. Um, that we could work through in the future, um, especially considering that people are going to want more online options coming out of the pandemic, um, because there is an expectation that um, they should be cheaper, that they don't bring a lot of the, um, you know, other value adds that in-person classes do, um, but they're not always, online learning is not always cheaper for the institution. So I think there has to be some messaging around that and really transparency about what this costs the institution and what it costs, um, what it costs students. Absolutely. And actually, Ashley, to, to this point, this kind of dichotomy about having online students versus in-person students and how that was really politicized in general, I, I think that in-person education in a lot of ways, um, you know, for certain student demographics is incredibly important for reasons that might happen beyond just what takes place within a classroom and the teaching and learning and thinking specifically about, you know, um, food insecure students who sort of rely on their colleges to, you know, help them provide 
food and shelter and some of these other basic necessities. So I know that two years ago, when you were one of the co-authors of uh, Varying Degrees, you took an in-depth look at food insecurity on two campuses and sort of paired it with Varying Degrees national data on food insecurity. What did you find then that you think is applicable now to the sort of current basic needs and security that many of today's uh, students are facing, you know, both due to the pandemic, but that, you know, is going to persist beyond the pandemic and existed before as well. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. And just before I jump in, just want to say this is me speaking from my um, personal capacity and not for my employer. Um, so I'm just going to start with like a very baseline and it's going to sound very basic to all of us, but we're also people who are on a webinar on higher education in the afternoon. Um, I think one thing that this study and others have pointed out is that food insecurity is an issue that college students face. Um, perception versus reality, that section in varying degrees often shows that um, the public's perception of what is going on in higher education is not always um, the reality of higher education. So I think that there can be some disconnects between the public and policymakers and what's actually happening on campuses, including food insecurity. So I think one thing that this, um, the in-depth look did and also the data from varying degrees and also the data that tons of other organizations are putting forward is that this is an issue and we need to continue talking about it. And I think that these conversations have led to some positive outcomes such as SNAP being expanded to college students um, during the national emergency pandemic. Um, unemployment insurance also being extended to some college students in the national emergency. So I think these conversations have actually contributed to some of the positive moves that have been made for students right now. Um, I think it's also important to move beyond just beyond thinking about the numbers of students and think about what these numbers mean. So in the 2019 data and other measures of food insecurity, there are different ways that it can look. It can look from reducing the quality of meals to worrying about meals running out and you won't be able to buy more, or it can be as extreme as skipping meals or not eating as much. Um, we need to think about what students who are in these sorts of situations are actually going through in the sort of um, mental complexities that they are trying to think through how to budget their meals or um, how to weigh maybe but paying rent versus, you know, buying groceries for their family. Um, these are a lot of mental gymnastics that students have to go through. And then we're thinking about also their students. So they're supposed to also be focusing on classes and doing coursework. And then in light of the pandemic, as we all know, this has created even more mental complexity as we're trying to think about what's safe, what do I feel comfortable with? Um, What's a healthy behavior if, you know, if they're a caregiving student, they might have student, you know, their children at home and how do you homeschool these, you know, when they aren't in person. So there's already, you know, for food insecure students, some other things on their mind beyond schoolwork. And then you add the schoolwork and then you add the pandemic concerns. And it's just really, really challenging for these students. Um, and on this note, the in-depth look for, um, where I talked with the University of Maryland leaders and also Dr. Edinger at Bunker Hill really talked about the impact that these student stories on that show, you know, what food insecurity actually means for these students have been really key in kind of changing some attitudes about food insecurity and realizing that basic needs and security actually is an issue and it's a completion issue and it's just a human issue and it you know, amplifying student voices is really key in trying to change some of these systems. Um, and then finally, on system change, we need to think about how this is a systemic problem. So campuses can have food pantries, and that's great, and we want to encourage that. But like Dr. Edinger and other campus leaders have repeatedly said, we can't food bank our way out of this issue. So we need to think about how to reform social safety net supports in order to better support students because going back to the original um, thing I said where this is an issue that we know about but not everyone else may not realize the importance of it or like the depth and severity of it. Um, that sort of assumption is why a lot of these policies currently students can't access a lot of social safety net supports. So we need to kind of change the system. And then when we change the system, we need to think about how to connect students with the system. So a GAO study found that even when students are eligible for SNAP, 
They access it at very low rates, often because they don't know that they're eligible or the campus navigator who's helping these students may not know that they're eligible. So just because you create a system doesn't mean that students are going to be able to plug into it easily. So I think we need to think about ways to help them be able to plug in and access the supports that they need. Um, a good example of this recently is the FCC broadband benefit for Pell eligible students. They sent out an email to students um, who filed a FAFSA and are Pell eligible to let them know that they uh, could be eligible for this broadband monthly broadband benefit. So um, I think that there are some thoughts about how to better connect students with the system. Um, so I think we need to continue those sorts of conversations um, of how to streamline that and make it easier for students to get supports. Great. Um, so Rachel and Sophie, just to kind of close this whole portion of questioning out, I mean, I think you've already been able to see how powerful of a tool public opinion research and data can be when it comes to fueling really important conversations that we need to be having and giving us different perspectives and angles. But once again, just now that you've been conducting um, higher ed, both qualitative and quantitative research for the past few years, what value in your mind does having this kind of public opinion data bring to the field? And are there any other lessons that you'd like to share with others who are interested in engaging in this, uh, this type of work moving forward? And once again, others, please feel free to weigh in if you have other thoughts as well. I can go first. So um, I would say one of the things that I really like about working in this space is that we have an ability to amplify student voice. Um, it's, we don't really have like a, not the greatest collective organizing effort of students in this country. We have a lot of organization around industry, right? Like higher education, the higher education lobby, but less among the students. And so the higher education lobby and students, sometimes their voices align, but sometimes they really don't. And so it's really important to hear what's going on on the ground. And one of my favorite things to do um, is to uh, attend and listen into focus groups. Um, it always gives us lots of uh, ideas of research to conduct, to follow up with, with quantitative research, um, to kind of hear how the tone and tenor of conversations may be changing around certain issues. Um, and it's just always been really insightful. Uh, a lot of our work, because we're working in the policy space, um, I, it, for me, it's always been hard to straddle that line between like working with students and then working in the policy space on behalf of students. And for me, it's always been a struggle. And so I like work that takes me back to uh, listening to students and trying to amplify their voice and understand what their lives look like. Um, I'll also say that something to flag that we've struggled with over the years, frankly, is the terminology higher education. We have a ton of jargon in this space. We say higher education, we say post-secondary, we say education opportunities after high school, um, colleges and universities where not everybody attends. Some people don't think community colleges are college, which drives me bananas. But like all of this to say is that even you'll notice in our survey, we have some amount of inconsistency. And that's because you know, for the most part, we like to call higher education education opportunities after high school because we want to recognize that we're not just talking about associate degrees and above. We're talking about lots of learning opportunities that are post high school, but we will lose some of our tracking data if we like norm all of our questions, um, making that change in nomenclature. So it's just been really interesting um, thinking about even the terminology you use and how it can change people's understanding and interpretation of questions. So as you um, as you work, uh, for people who work in this space, just be very careful with the terms that you choose uh, because it, again, will have lots of implications on how people answer questions. Absolutely. Um, I just want to second what Rachel said about the values of doing public opinion work. Um, I think um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a very, I started in this day, in, in this policy day, doing uh, higher education policy. Uh, so I, and, and like Rachel brought me into varying degrees, very like 
when I was still an intern. So that's when I real I realized the importance of being able to listen to the different perspective that you don't often listen to, you don't often get to know just in Washington, D.C. Um, and I have always uh, really grateful to be able to do this type of surveys and um, to do the focus group when you um, like, it's, it's a way for us to reach out to the students, the stakeholder that, that we care about in, in, in this way. And um, in terms of lessons, actually, uh, we have quite a few, like I love, personally, I learned quite a few lessons doing varying degrees, so I guess uh, four years now. So the first thing I would say is to be the ability to ask the right questions is not just like framing the questions in a way that um, that objective that is not leading, but also uh, think about how you're gonna interpret the result of that question when you get the result. Like many a time when we like we have like we really love the questions, but it just took us so long to find a way to interpret the result and that it's not confusing to everyone that's actually like big that's actually like really make this the number stand out and really meaningful and then um another lesson that i i guess like i should be aware of that but with uh, but uh with COVID, but what happened with covid last year when we fielded the surveys in february right before everything uh arrived right before the outbreak and before we went under lockdown and then we released the survey the data actually in may when we in the the midst of the pandemic when we have when we like when the country was going through like the very difficult phase of the pandemic we we, we have to like what part of the challenge of last year was like how can we make our data relevant now so think about like, so one of the thing that now whenever I uh, sit down and like, come, like create a new survey, like the, I always have to ask myself how, um, like how these questions, how the findings like re relevant during the time we ask the surveys and also relevant when we release the survey. This for surveys, for study like this is not like, political polling when you just like doing something very quickly and just release it out uh like just in a matter of days for for many reasons usually there's like a gap of a couple months between the time we fill the survey to the time we actually release the data so how to make those data still relevant uh to to people um it's it's always it's something that i have to like be more aware of now it's not like every year you're gonna have a pandemic, but yes. <laughs> no, God willing. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So thank you to everyone for, um, I already see that there are some questions coming in. So uh, please go ahead and um, I'm gonna turn it over to q and I have one more lightning round question for every single person on this panel and then we'll turn to the, the audience Q&A. So let's pretend that it's 2026. And we've all gathered again here, and it's the Varying Degrees 10-year reunion anniversary for the survey. Um, I'd love to know in just a couple words or less, like, where do you think the next big sticking points are going to be or hot button issues in higher ed? Or do you anticipate another five years of, of fairly steady results? Um, Ashley, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think that there will still be some things that are steady concerns about affordability and accountability. Those are, you know, just long standing issues. I don't see them going away in the next five years. One thing that I could see coming to the surface is about um, admissions. So the Supreme Court is deciding this summer whether or not to take up the Harvard case on affirmative action admissions at Yale. And so if the Supreme Court does take up that case and changes affirmative action, um, I could see that being a hot issue um, in the next few years. Interesting. Ernest? Yeah, agreed on admission. I think that'd be really interesting to track uh, what public opinions are on that over the next few years. Um, kind of along the same, in the same round a little bit, test optional opinions. I'm very interested to see uh, 
in the next few years, especially like, you know, one, how the pandemic has changed public opinion on that. Obviously, the pandemic has changed a lot of um, policy around that. A lot of colleges have, have, have made decisions about test optional or not test optional over the past year. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if those stick. Um, and I, again, what that confluence of actual policy change and what the public thinks looks like. Um, I also, I think a lot of us have said this, I'm gonna be interested to see um, and track over the next few years, um, how Americans feel higher education is contributing to um, kind of the, the, the impact that it's having on the country. Uh, Ali? Um, I think and I hope um, that a question that we explore in the next five years is how um, higher ed is how higher ed is doing in terms of closing equity gaps, specifically racial equity gaps. Um, I think the racial reckoning this in this past year is um, something that could kickstart more of that conversation um, across the country. And I hope that we um, as a country and as pe people working in higher ed, um, take more time to really be intentional in thinking about whether this system is truly being the engine of opportunity that we think it should be, or if it's actually continuing to perpetuate inequity. So I would love to see and hope that we see um, more opinion on that in the coming years. Sophie? Um, I would say one thing the pandemic show us is that, um, uh, show us is about high ed is that only learning um, I mean online learning is actually it's gonna be here to stay and um, not just online learning I think uh, in the next couple of years and moving forward they're gonna be just more and more integrations of technology into higher education changing the way students learn and how we think of uh, quality in higher ed so I think for varying degrees in the next few years, that is an area we definitely need to explore to see how that would change um, Americans' perspective of the value that high ed can bring. And Rachel? I mean, I guess like who the heck knows what the next five years are gonna bring because like the last five years have brought a lot and it's like, well, how could our lives be any crazier than they currently are? And it's like, well, I guess maybe I will see you in five years and we shall see. Um, but I guess my concern is that we're starting to see this sort of like trending down on a variety of indicators in sort of a negative way. And is that gonna continue over five years? You start to see these slight like, 2%, 3% um, dips. But then when you start extrapolating out, like what does that look like five years from now? And how are, are people gonna like really sour on higher education? Um, especially as we are going to see a very public debate over the next couple of years with um, the federal government's influence in higher education. Um, like Biden announced the American Families Plan. We're talking about free college. We're talking about debt forgiveness, the uh, administrative debt forgiveness and what that might look like, um, expansion of income-driven repayment and the regulatory agenda and all of this. And I just don't know what, if anything, that will influence people's decisions. I, I would think that if we do get to a place where we get free college, that would be pretty influential on people's opinions about higher education um, moving forward. And I'd be uh, interested to see uh, any politiz politic <laughs> politicization of that issue um, because I could see I could I could see a difference a partisan divide uh, on sentiments on higher education in that case as well. Great. Um, well, I'm going to start reading. We've gotten some good questions coming in, and actually, this one is fairly related to the uh, response you just gave, Rachel. But um, somebody's asking, do you think that the decline in wanting the government to fund higher education? is a pushback on what has been an increased support of socialism and anti-capitalism amongst our younger generation. Have you seen any sort of interesting generational divides in the data there? That's a good question. And off the top of my head, no, but usually the younger generations are more pro, and Sophie can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but they tend to be uh, more like we need more funding, we need more um, like free college, debt forgiveness, um, and we need uh, 
yeah, the government funding it because it is uh, good for society. Now I'd have to double check to be sure on that, but um, I actually think the pushback comes from older generations, from more white respondents and from more conservative respondents of that Venn diagram as well. There's a ton of overlap, right? Um, we know that the Republican Party is, is whiter and, and older. So that's where you'll kind of see the, the, the difference in pullback when looking at the data. But because I don't have like all the cross tabulations in front of me right now, I can't say 100% for sure. But that's the trend that we usually see. Great. And just kind of sticking with that theme and also the caveats that you don't have all the cross tabs open. Um, another question is uh, in relation to, you know, saying thank you for bringing up some of the inconsistencies and in language that we use in post-secondary ed and that education post high school can also mean pursuing the trades and apprenticeships. And so this, this question is asking um, or pertaining to sort of regional variations. Has your data illustrated any distinctive public opinions based on urban or rural populations um, or West, Midwest, East, et cetera? Um, I can take that but yeah Rachel feel free to chime in uh I we we do have that uh data that that's cost up you can actually see if you go uh, to our data tool we do have um extrapolate the um result by uh regions midwest not west uh, versus south and uh by ur ur urban versus rural and um to be Honest, I maybe I, that that's something that I haven't been able to really focus on. But when we look over some of the findings, we normally don't see a lot of uh, differences um, across the different regions. Um, so that's 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 my take. But uh, there might be um, 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 like differences for for some particular question. Um, yeah, I would say. So Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I would say too this year, and I just put um, everybody should have seen the data tool um, of which you can click on like different demographics on the left side and under funding. We had a question that we didn't report out this year um, that was more for informational purposes, but we've been tracking whether higher education is fine the way it is, like this statement, whether you agree with it or disagree with it over the past five years. And we haven't changed the statement because again, we're tracking it. Um, but we did ask this year, like, well, what do you consider higher education? We offered like a laundry list of like post uh, high school educational opportunities. And we had people um, sort of say like, yes, I consider this higher education. Yes, I consider this higher education. Um, and there was like certainly variability. Uh, uh, most people in the majority thought everything was higher education, except there was a bit of a divergence with apprenticeship, registered apprenticeships. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to take a look at that data, which to Sophie's point, you can then disaggregate um, by region. But if you want to see if there's any statistically significant differences, you have to go to the download and actually download the class tab. Great. Um, Ernest, this might be a great question to have you kick us off here. Somebody asked, how is higher education contributing to the economic recovery post pandemic? And does the public see the benefit of higher ed as a brain trust to help solve problems? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I do think it's a little early to say, um, necessarily point out all the ways that higher education might may or may not be contributing to uh, the economic recovery. Um, you know, we're coming off of a year where enrollments um, have been lower in higher education. Uh, and quite frankly, we're coming off of um, a year in kind of a recession that has not, despite predictions, looked a lot like some of uh, certainly the 2008 recession and some past recessions as well, where you saw an uptick in enrollment to some sectors of higher education uh, in the midst of kind of economic downturn. Um, so the jury is still, I think, out on, on how higher education is contributing, uh, but there are certainly uh, paths that higher education can, collectively can take, paths that I think the administration um, has, uh, the Biden administration has, has spent time kind of talking about um, and that you know, are, are taking part of the discourse right now. Um, in particular around uh, some of the discussions on free college, uh, free community college uh, in particular, and, and kind of free college for returning adults is a, 
um, a very specific section of the free college discussion. Um, but certainly, you know, I'm open to like other analysis from other panelists as well. Uh, I'm not sure that we can say for certain whether or not, you know, in the midst of uh, and in kind of the aftermath of this pandemic and, and in the middle of this economy um, and economic recovery, uh, the impact that higher education has had so far. So unless anyone else has an additional take, can see into the future that way, I think that in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap it up with this particular question. Um, time flies when you're having fun, but Rachel, I will kick it back to you to sort of close close us out today. Yeah, I just wanted to, it was lovely to see everyone and I hope again, like everybody is safe and healthy and that maybe next year we can do something in person, which will feel very novel um, after doing this two years remotely. And of course we will always keep our remote option because if we've learned anything this year, people are approaching our work in different ways and we want that opportunity to be available for everyone. Um, and so, I mean, with that, um, thank you, Tamara. Thank you, panelists. Again, visit very degrees.org. I put the link to our data tool in the chat. Um, and it was wonderful seeing everyone and please keep in touch.